Good afternoon. The National Assembly for Wales is now in session, and the first item this afternoon. No, I beg your pardon, have something before the first item. Um, it gives me great pleasure to announce that in accordance with Standing Order 26.75, the Higher Education Wales Bill was given royal assent on the 12th of March. Now we move to the first item on the agenda, which is questions to the First Minister. And the first question is Mohamed Ashgar. Thank you, Madam Presiding Officer. What plan does the Welsh Government have to improve access to GP surgery in Wales in 2015, please? Well, our plan is to improve access to GP services, which are a key part, of course, of a preventative primary care-led NHS, uh, set out in our new national plan for a primary care service. It's backed by over £40 million of the new funds and a new two-year deal with GPs. Thank you very much, First Minister, for the reply. <coughs> Four years ago, you made a manifesto promise to require GPs to hold appointments in the evenings and Saturday mornings. The latest figures show less than half of 1% of GP practices in Wales offer any Saturday appointments, and the percentage of GP practices offering evening appointments fell to just 7% last year. Does the First Minister agree that this pre-election promise back in 2011 was just an undeliverable gimmick or how long it will take to fulfil this promise? Well, I don't know where he gets his figures from, but I can tell him that 80% of GP practices are open for daily core hours or within one hour of daily core hours. It's an increase of 20 points from 2011. 97% of GP practices offer appointments at any time between 5 and 6.30 on at least two days a week, a 5% increase since 2011. 79% of GP practices offer appointments at any time in the later evening between 5 and 6.30 p.m. every day, an increase of 16% from 2011. And the percentage of practices closed for half a day uh, for a week has reduced from 19% in 2011 to 6% in 2014. As I say, I don't know where his figures are from. These are the official figures. Weekends. And it shows the Welsh Government I'm delivering. Weekends. <coughs> Christine Chapman. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, First Minister, I recently had a very positive meeting with the Health Minister to discuss capacity issues at surgeries in my constituency. We also discussed the action that is being taken to recruit and retain GPs, particularly in Valleys areas. Now, whilst I very much welcome the £1.8 million extra investment that has been announced for primary care services within Cwm uh, will the Welsh Government continue to work closely with the Health Board to develop the primary and community care workforce and ensure that that high-calibre staff continue to be attracted to work within the NHS in Wales? Yeah, absolutely, of course, and uh, I know that the uh, local health board are working very hard to make sure that that is uh, the case, and we want to make sure, of course, we attract high-calibre staff to all parts of Wales. Lindsay Bittle. Well, First Minister, the best way to get access to GPs is to adopt mm. Plaid Cymru's policy of employing a thousand extra doctors. Uh, will, you increase, will you increase the training places available, please? Uh, well, uh, I don't know how many GPs are included in that figure. We've never been told, of course. So uh, who, who knows? Uh, and in terms, uh, well, in terms of how to ensure that people can see GPs, the first thing to do is to make sure that people choose well. That they look to see to go to a pharmacist first, then perhaps go to a nurse with a GP practice, and then go and see the uh, GP. But of course, the number of GPs has risen by more than 11% over the past decade, and that shows, of course, that uh, more GPs than ever are working in Wales. Kirsty Williams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, as Llanutid and the surrounding communities anxiously await the response by the Bill Wells Medical Practice to the offer put forward to them by Powys Local Health Board, it's been clear there is no national procedure for dealing with the closure of GP surgeries. Uh, the CHC don't uh, clearly understand their role in a GP surgery closure situation and there's no <laughs> national guidance or protocol. Uh, would you look again at whether it is necessary to have a very clear national approach to handling threats to GP surgeries such as the ones we have implemented at the moment? Well, first of all, of course, the majority of GPs are self-employed contractors. We know that. They're not directly part of the health service in that way. Uh, th they must explain to the people they serve uh, the reasoning for their decisions. Uh, I very much hope, of course, that there will be agreement and the people of Llanotid will continue to have access to GP services uh, in their own community. Uh, I know the discussions have been, I understand, fruitful uh, in, the, uh, in the last few weeks, and I sincerely hope, of course, that that service will continue in the future. Question two, Joyce Watson. Uh, what assessment has the Welsh Government made of the impact of the bedroom tax in Wales? 
Well, our research has shown the impact of the reforms are not spread equally. The bedroom tax has a disproportionate effect on disabled people. Yeah. And this reform, combined with the remaining UK government's benefit and tax reforms, are hitting those, of course, around the poverty line and working age disabled households much harder than others. Thank you uh, for that answer, First Minister. But according to research by the Auditor General for Wales, the bedroom tax has indeed hit Wales the hardest. The number of tenants in areas shot up by a quarter in the six months after introduction, and there were more than 2,000 repossessions last year. First Minister, your government is doing what it can to soften the blow with the discretionary assistance fund and the extra 20 million for one and two bedroom homes. But do you agree with me that the best way, in fact the only way that people can be sure to rid us of this pernicious tax is by voting Labour in the next general election? Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Let's I mean, what, what we've seen, of course, is an attack on the most vulnerable in society. We know that the number of claimants affected by the bedroom tax in Wales was £31,000 as of November, uh, 31,000 people rather, as of November last year. We know that the reforms will reduce the income of working age households in Wales by around 900 million in 2015 to 16. We estimate an average annual loss of £500 per working age adult in Wales, and we know that the tax and welfare reforms hit those around the poverty line harder than middle and higher income groups. Typical, of course, of the Tories. Jonathan Saunders. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, statements such as these serve little purpose other than to scaremonger, especially when there was no mention whatsoever of the valid exemptions available for those with disabilities. Sheer hypocrisy. In 2001, the Labour government actually trialled the policy through the under-occupation pilot scheme and then in 2008 went on to introduce this for private tenancies. First Minister, will you acknowledge the £830 million saved to date and that the Housing Benefit Bill has fallen for the first time in a decade? Or do you endorse the something for nothing culture? I that think has you've asked the question. You've already asked a question. You asked two the questions. massive debts our country now faces. There is a rank hypocrisy. Uh, rank hypocrisy. They sit there claiming to represent the vulnerable. They attack the vulnerable. That much we know. You know, how wonderful it is, of course, to hear them say we've reduced the housing benefit budget. What they mean is we've attacked those people who need help the most. And that's why, of course, the bedrooms are. And yeah, I go around as members, and these benches will go around, and we listen to people who are affected by this bedroom tax. We see the effect it has on them, and we see that they are the people who are most affected and who most need help in society. I will not accept any lectures from the Conservative Party when they sit there hypocritically telling us they represent the vulnerable when their main task is to hit the vulnerable and protect the rich. That's why, of course, they've cut taxes for the richest in society. Roger Glyn-Thomas. Mae'r syniad o bleidleisio llafur er mwyn osgoi effeithiau y dreth ystafell wely yn eironig at weithio lleia oherwydd y mae'r llywodraeth yr SNP yn yr Alban wedi sicrhau nag yw tenantiad yn yr Alban yn cael ei effeithio gan y dreth arbennig yma. Mae'r llywodraeth gogledd i werddwn wedi ei wneud del gyda trysorlys er mwyn sicrhau nad yw e'n cael ei weithredu yng Ngogledd Iwerddon. Cymru yw'r unig wlad ddatganoledig yn uh, y deyrnas unedig sy'n cael ei effeithio gan y, uh, uh, y, deyrnas, uh, gan y dreth stafell weli. Er fod pobl Cymru wedi pedleisio i lywodraeth llafur? Well, I didn't go to apply Cymru, I'm not going to go to the dreth hyn. And in terms of course, uh, ma Bydd daliadau wedi cael ei ddarganoli yng Ngogledd Iwerddon a wneud yng Nghymru ar Alban. Mae'n wir i weud bod yr Alban wedi ffindo ar arian. Ond y gyd mae'r Alban wedi wneud yw talu yw defnyddio arian yr Alban lle dilyn o defnyddio arian y Dynas Unedig. So felly mae'n mynd i gyd sydd wedi digwydd i'w bod y trysorys wedi shifto'r bai a shifto'r um, dyletswydd at, at uh, yr Alban. A rydyn ni'r er Alban i dalu i rhywbeth dilyn y Dynas Unedig i dalu amdano. So felly unwaith to mae'n rhaid i'n sicrhau er les pawb yn y Dynas Unedig bod bobl yn cael gwared y llywodraeth uh, uh, prydeinig hyn yn mis mae er mwyn sicrhau tegwch yn y dynas unedig i gyd. We now move to questions. Not all agree with that, clearly. Um, I didn't hear, so it's... Um, 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 I now call the party leaders uh, to question the First Minister, and first is the leader of Welsh Liberal Democrats, Kirsty Williams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, in response to the McLennan Review of the Ambulance Service, your Health Minister said that we needed, and I quote, an ambiguous agreement on its nature as a clinical service. 
Do you agree that the Ambulance Trust needs to focus on delivering a clinically-led emergency response service? Yes. <coughs> well, thank you, First Minister. Could you explain then that if it has been deemed clinically appropriate that an individual does not need an ambulance, then why are the Welsh Ambulance Service Trust footing the bill for taxis yes. to hospital? Your government has said that it is committed to prudent health care. Is spending thousands of pounds ferrying 100 people to hospital truly value for money and enabling the Ambulance Trust to do its job? Well, the proportion of patients transported by taxi as part of the Alternative Transport Initiative is approximately 0.1% of the 450,000 calls that are made to the ambulance service. The cost of conveying a patient by emergency ambulance to A&E is approximately £183. Using a taxi, where appropriate, uh, can be as little as £4. Now, the figure that she has mentioned, and the figure that's, that we've seen today uh, on the news, uh, also includes... Uh, money spent on the patient care service, for example, where a patient requires transport to an outpatient appointment and there's limited capacity available. Health courier services, conveying laundry and test results and blood where appropriate, and to transport staff back to a scene that they've had to, uh, where they've had to leave a vehicle to support the patients, for a patient, for example, on a spinal board. So that figure is not just about taxis, it's about a number of services that are offered uh, by the ambulance service in a non-emergency context. First Minister, we said that we needed a clinically-led ambulance service. If a decision has been made by a clinician that you do not need the care of a paramedic or an ambulance technician to convey you to hospital, it does beg the question, why is the ambulance service then paying for taxis? It's been two years since Professor McClelland outlined her recommendations for the future of the ambulance service, and two years since she recommended that work should begin to transfer patient transport services out of the ambulance trust and into health boards so that we could have a better use of resources in conveying those patients who do indeed need to get to a hospital, but they don't need an ambulance to do so. In the latest update last month, it appeared that little or no work had been carried out on this recommendation. When can we expect to see health boards take responsibility for patient transports so that the ambulance service is allowed to focus on getting to those people who need it the most as quickly as possible? Well, it's not correct to say that nothing's been done. There's a pilot scheme in Cardiff uh, which gave rise uh, to the story that we saw this morning, and that is to see how best to divert people away from uh, needing to use an ambulance uh, in circumstances where they don't need to use an ambulance. But Let's not pretend this is an issue only for Wales. In 2008 to 11, England spent £30 million on taxi transport as part of uh, transport within the health service. So it is something that is commonly used across the whole of the UK. And of course, the pilot scheme uh, will be there in order to assist evaluation on how to improve non emergency patient care in the future. We now move to the Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Archie Davis. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. First Minister, what's your assessment of your government's campaign, which was held last September, to support your high street? Uh, well, we are looking, of course, at business rates to see how business rates can help uh, those businesses that uh, need further help. We have, for example, provided funds for um, towns to be, uh, to be refurbished and to be revitalised. We've done that, of course, uh, through various schemes. Uh, and, of course, uh, we've uh, made sure that by bringing investment into Wales, creating more jobs into Wales, people have more money to spend and that will help small businesses. First Minister, that campaign was launched in September last, last year uh, and at its heart it had a window dressing campaign, it had a treasure hunt in Lampeter and the great success was that 274,000 people uh, had looked at Facebook and Twitter. Uh, ultimately, First Minister, from the figures we saw yesterday, there is a huge pressure on our high streets. Eighteen months ago, we brought forward our document, Vision for the High Streets. At the moment, we are seeing, because of your government's inaction, one shop every other day closing on our high streets. Now, you talked about business rate relief, you talked about planning, you've talked about various initiatives. We've had three different ministers from your government been responsible for regeneration of our high streets since 2011. But actually, we're not seeing anything really tangible delivered. We've got real pressure on the Welsh high streets and little coming from your government. What can we expect over the next 12 months to actually reverse these declining numbers on the Welsh high street that sees vacancy rates some of the worst in the UK? 
Well, I did hear the member for Ceredigion protest at the way that Lampada was uh, portrayed there. She, she, will, she will do it more effectively than I, given the fact that it's in, uh, it's in her constituency. Uh, but uh, can, can I say that in order for shops to prosper, they need customers. Customers. Now, we have done what we can uh, to bring in investment into Wales and to create jobs. We need the UK government to do its part. The reason why so many shops are struggling is because of the policies of the UK government, not providing people, not providing people with light at the end of the tunnel, not providing people with hope, destroying people's disposable incomes. That's why shops haven't got customers, because of the inaction of the party opposite. What a ludicrous answer, First Minister. I mean, frankly, we've got an economy that is surging ahead of the rest of the Western world. We've got greater employment now than we've ever had in our history. But yet, when it actually falls into your lap, you want to pass that blame. As I pointed out, you've had three ministers responsible for regeneration here in Wales since 2011 elections. We have some of the highest vacancy rates on our high street. You have failed to deliver a business rate relief scheme to the high street that the FSB and other operators have been calling for. Your planning system is overly bureaucratic and delays businesses being innovative and changing to meet the challenge of the internet. You've got so many tools at your disposal, yet your efforts are lamentable. What over the next 12 months can we actually see you delivering to reverse the figures that I've given you today, where one every other day shop is closing on our high street? I, can't really, I know he doesn't understand market principles, but uh, those of us <laughs> benches might try and help him. Uh, businesses thrive because of demand for their products, and uh, that demand is driven by people's disposable incomes. Yeah, they do not have the disposable enough. incomes they had five years ago. In five years ago, in 2010, that's what's happening to our businesses. Can I also say uh, th th this to him as, as well? I mean, he, he sits there claiming that the UK government has no role in this at all, but as I mentioned before, he cannot escape responsibility for the squeeze that has occurred on people's incomes, but he is trying to do that. He cannot uh, avoid responsibility either for his own party's plans, which is to cut the amount of money available to business. 30% cut in economic development funding, 12% cut in local government funding. Now, how is that meant to assist businesses in Wales? He asks the question, it's a fair question, what can we expect over the next year? It's a fair question, I'll give him the answer. The Labour government in May, and then things will change for the better. We now move to Plaid Cymru, and the questions this afternoon will be asked by the Deputy Leader, Ellen Jones. Prif Weinidog yn y bedair mynedd ers cyfrifiad 2010, beth yw'r prif gamach llywodraeth chi wedi gymryd i atal dirywiad y Gymraeg fel iaith fyw yng nghymunedau'r gorllewin? Wen, gynta i gyd wrth gwrs, y peth gynta mae'n rhaid sicrhau yw cynyddiad yn y nifer. Siomedig, mwyna wedi bod, a oedd yna'n wir pan oedd chdaeth chi yn y llywodraeth hefyd, mae'n herin i gyd. Yn ail, wrth gwrs, i sicrhau bod bol yn defnyddio'r iaith, nid i wneud hwnna wrth gwrs helpu'r mentre iaith drwy raglen bwrw mlaen. Hefyd, wrth gwrs, i sicrhau bod yn arian cyllido ar gael i ganol fan e, lle mae'r iaith Gymraeg yn gallu gael ei defnyddio fel iaith naturiol yn wedi mewn cymunedau, lle mae'r iaith wedi gwanhau dros y digawdau. Prif fwyn i'n dod, dwi'n gwybod beth sydd angen i wneud, dwi'n eisiau gwybod beth sut i chi mynd i gyflawni'r hyn sydd angen i ddwneud. Un o'r meisydd mwyaf dylanwadol o ran cryfder y Gymraeg yw'r maes cynllunio, ac er mwyn diogelu'r Gymraeg, mae angen gwneud y Gymraeg yn ystyriaeth berthnasol statudol a rhoi mwy o rym i awdurdodau lleol i bennu targedau tai eu hunen. Mae yna un cyfle deddfwriaethol gyda chi mewn llywodraeth i gyflwyno hyn mewn deddfwriaeth, sef y mesur cynllunio, a di chi'n bwriad i cymryd y cyfle yna neu anwybyddu'r cyfle. Mae'n gallu wneud hwn nawr, wrth gwrs. Mae'n gallu cymryd yr iaith Gymraeg mewn i ystyriaeth, ac yn ail, wrth gwrs, mae'n gallu Um, uh, sicrhau bod yn cael targedau i hunen ynglyn â thai. Lle mae'n anghytuno a beth mae'r llywodraeth wedi gweud, felly os mae'n y dystioliaeth yn nhw i gefnogi targed arall, mae'n gallu wneud hynny. Does dim, dim i stop o'n wneud hynny na'r? Na, dydyn nhw ddim yn gallu gwneud hynny, a dyna pam mae'r cynghorau sir wrth gwrs wedi ysgrifennu ato chi. Nifer ohon enw, gan gynnwys rhai llafer, wedi ysgrifennu ato chi yn gofyn i chi i gymryd cyfle deddfwriaethol y mesur cynllunio i gryfhau i gallu nhw i fedru gymryd penderfyniadau ar sail y Gymraeg mewn achosion cynllunio ag hefyd i wneud asesiadau o anghenion tai lleol yn unol a, a cymunedau lleol hynny. Felly 
mae'r cyngore sir yn angetuno gyda yr hyn i chi newydd ddweud, a wnewch chi felly gwrando arnyn nhw, gwrando ar nifer ohono ni fel gwrthbleidiau fan ein hefyd, sydd eisiau gweld y mesur yr unig gyfled edfwriaethol sydd gyda chi yn weddill yn y cynulliad yma, yn cael ei ddefnyddio i gryfhau gallu'r Cymraeg i oroesu yn y cymunedau Cymraeg. O tri ffeith, yn gyntaf gyd, mwyn nhw'n gallu ei wneud e. Os mwyn nhw'n dystiolaeth ar gael gyda nhw. Mwyn nhw'n gofyn i chi. Yn ail, wrth gwrs, ni wedi, wrth gwrs, newid y mesur i gryfhau'r Gymraeg. Angen y gorau, wrth gwrs, hyn rhyw syniadau call ynglyn â fel allwn ni'n symud maen yn y dyfodol. Bell allwn ni ddim wneud yw cefnogi sy'n falle lle byddai pob cais yn gwrthio gael rhywbeth o asesiad iaith. Dwi'n gwybod bod neb sy'n hwyr o'n gweud hwnna. Ond y trig o stori yw, ble chi'n rhoi'r llinell? Pa fath o gynlluniau dele cael asesiad, pa fath dele ddim cael asesiad, a ymhaf o ddych chi'n sicrhau bod rhywun ddim yn trial mynd o un llinell neu llall a trial o sgoi y rheolau. So felly, maen y gwaith wedi gael ei wneud lan i nawr. Ni'n digon parod gwrs i sicrhau bod y trafod yn parhau er mwyn ffindo mwy o ffyrdd er mwyn i warchod y Gymraeg yn y cymunedau Cymraeg yn y dyfodol. We now move back to questions on the paper, and it's question three, Alan Fred-Jones. Diolch, am wnaeth y prif unidog ddatganiad ar ganolfannau Cymraeg i oedolion. Ni'n gwireddu ag ymhellion y grŵp ar y lygu Cymraeg i oedolion, a sefydlu beth sy'n cael ei alw ar hyn o bryd yn endid cenedlaethol i arwain y maes yn strategol. Yn dilyn blwyddyn interim i ganiatau i'r endid sefydlu o'r cyntaf o Aws 2000, 16 bydd y canolfannau yn dod i ben a'r endid fydd yn gyfrifol am arwain y darparwyr. Dewch yn fawr. Fel da ni'n gwybod, mae'r polisi dysgu ail iaith yn yn ysgolion ni wedi profi yn fethiant a wedi cael ei ddeirniadu yn hael. A does dim symud wedi bod ar ôl dwy flynedd ers gyhoeddi yr adroddiad beirniadol hwnnw. O ran y canolfannau yma, ar broses da chi'n newydd ysgrifio greu'r endid cenedlaethol, bydd fydd angen i'r corff hwnnw fod yn un credadwy gyda profiad ymarferol llwyddiannus, ond proses fewnol ydy hi fel dwi'n deall, y proses dendro yma. Mae'n proses gydd, ac er tegwch ar cyrff sy wedi cyflwyno ceisiadau, ac er sicrhau trylloiwd, er anwewch chi benodi ar farnwr anibynol i sicrhau tegwch a gwrthrychedd y proses yma. Yn gyntaf, gwrs, yr eswn pan dys dim byd wedi newid ers a i adroddiad Sioned Davies gael ei gyhoeddi, achos y ffaith bod yr athro Donald sy'n wedi gyhoeddi adroddiad ynglyn â'r cyrchlyn i hunan, sy'n felly ddim yn wneud synnwyr i un i fwy dyma yn y llall, yn gwmws beth sy'n wedi digwydd. Yn ail, wrth gwrs, dwi'n gweld bod yn rhyw fath o broblem fynyn ynglyn â'r anibyniaeth y system. Ni yn styried y ceisiadau sy'n cael ei rhoi mewn ar hyn o bryd. Dwi ddim yn gweld unrhyw tystiolaeth i weud bod yn rhyw fath o broblem ynglyn a thegwch y system hynny. Siwsi Davis. Diolch llywydd. Y Brif Wynidog, yn eich tystiolaeth i'r Pwylgor Craffi ar waith y Brif Wynidog yr wthnos y nefetha, wedoch bod chi wedi cyhoeddi canllawiau toolkit i asesu effaithiau penderfyniadau polisi ar yr iaith Gymraeg. Pe bydd yr canllawiau ar waith llynedd Ydych chi meddwl y byddwch chi wedi cymryd yr un penderfyniad i gael gwared ar gallu'r canolfannau Cymraeg i oedolion? Wrth gofio y sefyllfa ariannol, beth ydyn ni'n trio yn wneud i'w blaen o'r ieithu, wrth gwrs, le dyle'r arian cael ei halan. Ydyn ni'n wneud hynny, wrth sicrhau bod yn cyfalaf ar gael i'r canolfannau iaith, a sicrhau, wrth gwrs, trwy bwrw mlaen bod ni'n gweithio'n agos gyda pob corff sydd yn cefnogi'r iaith Gymraeg yn ein cymunedau. Lle ma, sefyllfa, lle ma'n alai orian ar gael, felly wrth gwrs mynd bwysig dros ben i flaen o'r iaithu, lle ma'r arian yn mynd. Question for Nick Ramsey. Will the First Minister make a statement on Welsh Government policies for promoting renewable energy? Well, we're committed to promoting and supporting renewable energy projects and maximising their economic and environmental benefits to Wales. Um, thank you, First Minister. As you'll be aware, four of the proposed uh, new possible hydroelectric tidal lagoons have been earmarked off the Welsh coast, two of them in the Severn estuary. Uh, I appreciate this is early days, um, but the potential of these lagoons for future power generation is enormous, with the possibility of around 7% of England and Wales' uh, overall power generation. Do you agree with me that uh, 
the, these lagoons represent a, a potential reliable um, power source without some of the wider implications of a barrage uh, or indeed visually intrusive wind farms and uh, will your government be uh, negotiating with both with the companies involved and with the UK government to make sure um, that Wales does benefit more from tidal energy than we have in the past? Well, bear in mind, of course, that the problem is we have very little powers at the time being in terms of marine energy. One megawatt actually is the, uh, is the limit. Uh, we know, of course, of the uh, proposals that have been put forward as a result of the St David's Day process, which we, we welcome. That will give us more uh, control and, more importantly, the ability to pr promote renewable energy in the way that we would want. The difficulty is, of course, that we don't control the uh, rocks, the Renewables Obligation Certificates, as Scotland does, and that means we're not able to offer as much money as Scotland does because of their control of their subsidy <coughs> regime, which is why Scotland has done better than we have, despite the fact their circumstances are uh, less promising because there's been more money, they've been able to put more money on the table, they've been permitted to put more money on the table in the way that we have not. But I, I take its point, I think that there's great potential uh, for tidal energy in Wales. Uh, and uh, the key will be, and this is something that we have uh, spent time uh, evaluating, that there are jobs onshore as well. We believe, for example, that Port Talbot is in a very good position as a deep dock to act as a maintenance and manufacturing base, and potentially, if they go further west, Milford Haven as well. Peter Black. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. First Minister, one of the reasons why renewable energy is being promoted by the UK Government is, of course, to provide energy security. Uh, as well as the environmental impact as well. Um, but that is also one of the reasons why they're promoting fracking as, as a means of, of extracting um, additional energy sources. Given the Welsh Government's stance on fracking, which I uh, whole, wholly agree with, what attitude is the Government taking towards test drilling, uh, which of course is the first stage towards fracking? Will you be able to give guidance on that as well? Well, as far as boreholes are, are, are concerned, uh, that is a matter for local authorities to determine that the, the, the position we have taken is against uh, fracking against the, the obtaining of shale gas. Uh, that is, we believe, a strong message uh, that is being sent to the industry as to the government's view uh, on uh, the extraction of, say, of shale gas and indeed fracking. Energy security is absolutely crucial. The member's right. But that does not mean, of course, that we should try to obtain energy at any cost. And that, of course, is the reason why uh, the minister has taken the action that he has. Question five, Lynn Eagle. Will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh <coughs> Government's current free entry policy to National Museum's Wales sites? Yes, of course. The programme for Government uh, commits us to the policy of free entry to the seven museums run by uh, Amgiedwa Cymru National Museum Wales. First Minister, I know that you're aware of my opposition to charging for underground tours at Big Pit National Coal Museum, proposals which very fly good. in the face of our free entry policy. I'm very grateful to the Director of National Museums Wales for meeting with me to discuss this proposal. And while I do understand the huge savings that they have to make, I do believe that the underground tour is the very heart of Big Pit and brings to life our industrial heritage in a truly unique way. First Minister, will you take the opportunity today to rule out charges for the underground tour. I, I thank the member for her interest, Big Pit of course being in her constituency, and I can say to her there will be no charges for underground tours at Big Pit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That has been made clear to the National Museum, and the National Museum understand of course uh, that uh, they are obliged to keep to the government's, uh, to the programme for government's commitments. William Graham. And he was uh, most grateful to the First Minister for his statement just now. I'm sure to reassure many people in the and have an area. Free entry has coincided with an average of a 110% increase in visitors to, to, uh, to Big Pit, which is clearly to be encouraged, but only 15% increase to the Roman Museum and Baths and Amphitheatre at Caleon. Has your government looked at the implications for this considerable difference between the increase in attraction? Well, first of all, we must welcome the fact that there has been an increase. <coughs> it's right to say that the Big Pit has had a particularly uh, impressive increase. It, it is quite unique in that sense, uh, as is, of course, Killian with the, with the amphitheatre there. Uh, but, of course, uh, Big Pit began life as a paid-for attraction before I came into the National Museum. And now, of course, we see more and more people understanding that the underground tour is free. Uh, and, of course, uh, it means that we have more and more visitors. And it's important, of course, to, uh, for us to remember the, the rich heritage uh, that the mining industry uh, created both in South Wales but also in Pembrokeshire and in the northeast of Wales as well. Bethan Jenkins. 
Um, First Minister, you will know that National Museums Wales have had um, in-year cuts on top of um, cuts already um, f f forced on them um, by uh, the Welsh Government. I've spoken to the Director General on numerous occasions, so they're now in a predicament of having to change staff working conditions or close specific sites um, or end the free entry. So they're looking at the changing the terms and conditions, which obviously is very unpopular. I wonder what discussions your Government has had with them to try and seek um, an alternative to this um, particular predicament because of course um, only the population of Wales will suffer if they have to pay for access to these most vital um, public attractions. Well I, I would say to the member uh, what I said some moments ago namely uh, there will be no payment for entry into any of the National Museum's uh, attractions. It's right to say of course that where there are exhibitions within the National Museum particularly uh, that come from time to time that they are paying attractions uh, but there will be no payment uh, for uh, the museum's uh, ordinary offering, and particularly no payment for the underground tour play pit. William Powell. Jock Lowith. First Minister, you uh, may have received the news that uh, last week the Brecon Beacons National Park Planning Authority gave the go-ahead uh, to a multi-million pound uh, redevelopment uh, in the heart of Brecon around the museum and gallery, which has been funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and supported also by Powys County Council. Um, and it will incorporate a herit uh, heritage and cultural hub which will greatly enrich experience in that area. Uh, First Minister, this, uh, I hope you'll join me in welcoming this uh, good news which goes back, I think, to the days of the partnership government uh, and was spearheaded very much in that uh, early time by my colleague Jenny, uh, Baroness Jenny Radisson of uh, Roth Park. And will you, uh, First Minister, give uh, a guarantee that the Welsh Government will look in the future to giving its support, financial and in other ways, to encouraging such important developments of this kind? Well, I, I join the member, of course, in welcoming the uh, proposals. Uh, he tests my memory when he talks about the partnership government, uh, but nevertheless, I, I take his word uh, on that point. Uh, well, of course, from our point of view, we, we could not revenue fund any new development. He will know that, uh, but he will also know, of course, that, that capital uh, uh, assistance is available for good projects across Wales. Christine Chapman on National Museum. Thank you. I, I was delighted when the, the Cunning Valley Museum Trust was established to take over the running of the museum in Aberdeer when it faced closure last year. Importantly, the, uh, the trustees have retained a policy of free entry for when the museum is open. Uh, First Minister, will you join with me in congratulating the Council, Museum Trustees and local community for making this happen? And how, uh, on what plans uh, has the Welsh Government to support community groups such as this in the future? Yes, I thank the member for the question. I've, I've been impressed by the positive way the Council, the Trust and the local community are now collaborating to keep the local museum uh, open. Uh, of course, running a museum does require a long-term commitment. Uh, we understand that. I can say that, that Kamal, uh, which of course, as the member will know, is a division of the Welsh Government, does provide specialist advice, support and training to any organisation which demonstrates a willingness to work to the national standards, in other words, the accreditation scheme for museums and galleries in the United Kingdom. So that assistance is available in order to make sure that museums reach the standard that I'm sure they would want to reach anyway. Question of six, Mike Hedges. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on the importance of Wales' higher education establishments in developing the Welsh economy? Well, they make a huge contribution to our economy. They're large local employers that generate high, highly skilled graduates. They attract investment. They stimulate the growth of spin-out and start-up companies. And, of course, as demonstrated by Wales' great results in the recent Research Excellence Framework, they conduct research with real social and economic impact. Uh, can I thank you for that response? Uh, as you just said, with the research being carried out uh, at Welsh universities, especially Swansea and Cardiff, being amongst the best in the world, what more can be done to use that research expertise to develop the Welsh economy? Well, I, I think it's fair to say that universities have, in the past few years, understood better their role in, uh, as economic drivers, and in particular their role in working uh, with businesses and potential entrepreneurs to, to roll out and commercialise the knowledge that the, uni the universities create. Uh, I dare say that 10 years ago that, that wasn't quite as clear uh, as far as uh, universities were uh, concerned. But it's absolutely right to say, um, and I'll give you one example, the, the Smart Innovation Support uh, Programme, that we are focused on driving uh, research with a clear emphasis on uh, first of all, larger discrete strategic uh, projects, but also, of course, to make sure that we create research that has a social and economic benefit at the end of it. And I very much welcome the fact that our universities have bought in uh, to that idea. And we see now, of course, the spin-offs around Cardiff University, 
We see the spin-offs as a result of the Institute of Life Sciences in Swansea and, of course, the great work being done in other universities and all our other universities in Wales in terms of making sure that the knowledge they generate generates a benefit for the local community. Paul David. Uh, Dear economy well, I'm honoured, of course, to know Beth Seward uh, Digwyd and Sao colleague uh, save, of course, uh, a Nord Isikar High Board now integrate your and, and, and Digwyd wrong a colleague. Are this Bethlach? I have it, of course, uh, uh, previous colleague. I'm Chris Howie. 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 I'm in this case, I'm proud of the colleague. He will get a previous call on Emma Sicker High Board, a process now in Par High and a Devodal. Pick Anthony. First Minister, will you also, in the same vein, recognise the considerable achievements of places like Colleague Cumoyth and Nangaru in my constituency, built on the site of the former <coughs> Nangaru Colliery, and the three students who have recently been accepted into Oxbridge universities through the educational programmes there, including my one particular uh, uh, constituent, Callum Haggart, who, uh, from Tony Reval, who captained Wales under 18s to victory. Uh, last weekend, would you be willing to write to those students to actually congratulate them on their achievement and do you actually recognise the particular role that colleges like Colleague of Cymoedd actually play in educational excellence in Wales and the long-term benefits to the Welsh economy? Well, well your constituent sounds like a true polymath in the sense of being you know, one of those people good at sport and academically good as well. I mean, the sort of people who uh, we all do in school. Uh, the, the important point is this. I would obviously offer my congratulations uh, to these students as I would offer my congratulations to all students who uh, go forward to uh, higher education and other forms of education uh, in Wales, but uh, he mentions the, the Oxbridge process. It's good to see uh, youngsters uh, making sure that well, youngsters being feel, feel that they're able to apply to the Oxbridge universities in a way perhaps that uh, wouldn't have occurred to them in years gone uh, by. But it is an early indicator, of course, that the strategy, uh, as indicated to us by Paul Murphy, of encouraging more youngsters to apply for the Oxford Universities is beginning to bear fruit. Question seven, Julie Morgan. Um, thank you, presiding officer. What plans does the Welsh <coughs> Government have to increase childcare provision in Wales? Well, ensuring access to affordable, high-quality childcare for all children and families across Wales, especially the most disadvantaged, remains one of our top priorities. And of course, it's central to our tackling poverty agenda and the early years and childcare. Uh, thank you, First Minister, for that response. Um, I welcome uh, Welsh Labour's commitment to double the amount of childcare available for three- and four-year-olds to help working parents, because I think this is absolutely essential. But can the First Minister use his influence to try to persuade um, HMRC to continue to provide a lease for a workplace nursery at the Inland Revenue in Llanishan, um, in my constituency of Cardiff North, as the present nursery is due to close on August the 29th, and I think it is vital we keep all forms of childcare going. Yes, I, I remember in 2012, uh, the member was particularly um, vociferous in the campaign to keep uh, the provision at HMRC. Uh, as a result of the stance that she took, uh, and uh, perhaps a little in terms of the letter that I wrote in October 2012, uh, the nursery contract was then renewed. Now, of course, it faces uh, expiry uh, in terms of the present contract by October this year. I will write once again uh, to uh, urge uh, the HM, H, urge HMRC to continue this provision because we know that it fulfills such an important um, duty in terms of enabling people to go to work. And I mean, those with, with, ch with children will have, will have recognised that from years, uh, years gone by and those with children now. But I will write to HMRC along the same lines I wrote in 2012 and I will once again make clear the uh, strong views of so many uh, in her constituency and beyond, and in particular, of course, the campaign that she has led both now and in years gone by. Byron David. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, um, a really good news story is the uh, Westminster Government's increased childcare provision, uh, and especially the introduction of tax-free childcare. Uh, this is creating a true choice for parents about whether to return to work or stay at home. 
Will you, First Minister, join me in welcoming these improvements in childcare provision to date by the current UK Government and also outline how you are ensuring childcare provision is maximised in Wales? Well, uh, we already have childcare provision, of course, that we have taken forward, but uh, I hear what the Member says. He wishes to see childcare extended. Uh, I extend the invitation to him to welcome the commitment made by my party, both at the UK level and here in Wales. Uh, Jill Slowith, <coughs> one uh, significant gap is wraparound care, particularly for working parents who want to take advantage of their free two-and-a-half nurse hour nursery place um, but can't find a local childcare provider to deliver and collect a child for such a short placement. Um, authorities in England offer vouchers to working parents which can be used as part payment at a full-time nursery and some also offer two-and-a-half um, full days a week rather than five half days a week, which working parents report as being hugely beneficial to them. I wonder what can the Welsh Government do to encourage flexibility from local authorities in the delivery of their statutory nursery provision? Well, she seems to advocate nursery vouchers uh, th that I can see. Now, it's important, of course, that the flexibility is there. I understand that. Uh, but I would not want to see a, a system whereby existing uh, provision is undermined by the use of uh, vouchers. It's a matter for local authorities, of course, to consider how best to uh, provide the childcare that they are obliged to, to uh, provide. And, of course, I'm sure they will study what happens in some authorities in England with interest. Question 8, Sandy Mewis. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Officer. First Minister, will you provide an update on the support the Welsh Government is giving to carers in North East Wales? Yes, Carers Strategies Wales Measure 2010 and, of course, the Social Services and Wellbeing Act 2014 clearly set out our commitment to carers. And we have invested £238,400 to support carers in the north of Wales, including working with young adult carers and GPs. Thank you for that. I recently joined staff <coughs> volunteers and carers at an event which marked the future role of NUKIS, the North East Wales Carers Information Service. I first worked with NUKIS some 21 years ago when it was the Carers Project. Then 65 carers used their service. Now they're more than 8,600 and rather sadly in some ways going up all the time, but what would they do without them? This is an illustration of just how valuable the work of NUKIS has become in North East Wales in giving this support. Their success is an example of local agencies working to together. So can I ask you, First Minister, First Minister, to join me in congratulating NUKIS on the work they're doing. We know the money it saves the NHS, not just here in Wales, but also through the UK. And, and, and and can I ask you to continue to uh, uh, help carers across Wales access the support and information they need to maintain their own health and well-being? Uh, can I thank the member for her comments and join with her uh, in the sentiments that she has expressed? I think there are two things worth um, mentioning. Firstly, our carer's strategy sets out our commitment to carers. And a key theme within it is uh, ensuring they have access to information and support the support and information that they need in order for them to be able to uh, undertake their caring role and to enable them, of course, to maintain their own health and well-being. Also, of course, the Social Services Act uh, will replace the measure and that will strengthen our commitment to carers, giving them the same rights as people they care for. And I think the, uh, the commitments that have been made, both in terms of legislation and in terms of the strategy, I hope will show the value that the Welsh Government places on what carers deliver not just for those they care for, but for society as a whole. Darren Miller. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, one of the things that carers regularly tell me is that they occasionally need some respite uh, from their caring duties in order that they can recharge their batteries and, of course, to prevent burnout. Given that, that uh, those short periods of uh, respite can often lead to them being able to undertake and continue their uh, caring duties to a greater extent than they would be able to otherwise, do you think that it would be worthwhile introducing a right to respite for carers uh, in the future, as was a commitment of the Welsh Conservatives in our manifesto in 2011? Uh, well, I mean, well, all of us, I'm sure, would recognise the importance of respite for carers. That much is true. Uh, in terms of a right to respite, uh, I, well, more work would need to be done in terms of what the cost would be, inevitably, uh, but also in terms of how that would uh, work on a practical basis, uh, so that we could not give a commitment to introducing a right at this stage, although we all recognise, of course, the, um, the need for carers to have respite, and the strategy and, indeed, the legislation, we hope, will move forward in terms of being able to uh, assist with the need for respite in the future. Question 9, Antoinette Sandbach. 
Will the First Minister make a statement on the use of locums in the Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board area? Well, locum appointments provide essential flexibility in staffing numbers to manage patients safely during peaks in demand or problems with recruitment. It's the responsibility, of course, of local health boards and trusts to determine whether a locum needs to be appointed or agency staff needed, having explored all other options. I'm grateful uh, for your statement, First Minister. Um, an arbitrary reduction by the Betsy Cadwallader Health Board from a 50% uh, use of locums to a 25% target has uh, led to services being considered unsustainable. How can you, um, how can the, you justify that when a neighbouring health board operates some of its services on a 75% locum basis and considers that those services are both safe and sustainable? Any service that relies uh, on non-permanent staff to deliver the majority of its services uh, is not going to be as robust as one where permanent staff do deliver the majority of services. We know, for example, uh, at Asperti Glancloyd with the department, the, the Ops and Gynae department there, uh, that there has been a strong reliance for, for some time on temporary staff with all the difficulties that brings. Now, I, I refer members, of course, to the letter uh, that all members have seen, um, a short report from the Deputy Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Nursing Officer, which outlines, of course, uh, the difficulties that currently exist at a Spati Glancloid, but they are difficulties that will need to be resolved. Uh, it will take work to resolve them, but as members have heard me say many times, uh, that department must be restored within 12 months, and of course, the CERNIC will be placed on a site at Glancloid. Clear Griffith. So with my higher doctor, I just drawn that of locums now. Anybody say I mean a dire blunder? My higher question now. I think we're just doing another bunny all now. We're pumping another bunny all dire blunder than all. We've been well, a great degree, but see what he now did. On the degree, of course, poor Betsy could well have done what he got. He did. Pedwar million have been there. Our doctor had locum to the man. Well, he could have done what he printed. Doctor had done all. Wrote as he got all on air. He knew he had it. He could have. But registrars and other normal letters, but he read some. But he put in Gaddel or Heroid. But man, who this could be? Well, the fig could lay on. So, but now the fig on another party. Yes, man, we should be there. It's on the edge. Well, he got off in pa. Gamme Marsh or Dreth and Cymru, Sicker High Vote, Mithergon, it didn't need and Cali her for the Irish Cruci on Heaven Cali Cardu, Ermoin Sicker High Vote, and a Sai of the Bunyeth, Akan Weir, Vesli Sai, or Variant, are the Toria Locum. Well, on your men, with this or Bethmer, with where the reader of an Anglia Savasta and Rexam, Beth Asaway, you hun. Ma Burth Yechid Betsy Cadwalla, where you come with Saul Cam, Ermoin Recruto, Doctoriate Parhao. Uh, many, many uh, headhunting agencies, many of the Sikhai Burn Edric Tramor, many of the Nade Lotvaro Bethe, Edwin Trio Recutio Bowal. You can go Bob on a problem, get a agwed, a professional tea at Radon and Hindu Breed, one of the new, you can get in honey. Best man Sikhai, of course, you bought a agwed and new, about Moya Moya Bowal, and Shemindi Radon Honey and Glancloid, and Barhal, and the demand. And then Gumus was a bit in email to order to the need, and Gumus was a bit more for the Akhish need. I mean, silver button that and Gumus with a doctorate in Wigan are Bendy Guir and an Adranish and Aid Hibbit. Thank you, First Minister. We now move to item two. Which